he has got Brother Michael Allen ready to fill the pulpit for us today. And uh, his mother's been hurting for each. This be the first time. It will be. Thank you for reminding me, Mark. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll recap what Mark just reminded me of so wonderfully and quietly and tenderly is that um, my mother is here. So I'm well, thankful. Um, and I always kind of get wound up like a top anytime I get to preach or have the opportunity. Um, I always feel like I'm going to mess it up, especially if my mother's going to be in town and she got a last minute flight. Um, she's sitting right here next to, in between my two beautiful children and next to my beautiful wife. Two, half of our tribe of children are sitting here. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I get the opportunity to preach at different churches here and there around the area. And, um, what makes this a little bit more nerve-wracking is because those churches I can leave and I don't have to face them anymore. But I have to come back and face you all. And so does Pastor Bill if, if I lay an egg. Uh, so, <laughs> but um, thank you. Thank you, church family. Thank you, Pastor Bill. Uh, Pastor Zach, and just uh, patting me on the shoulders and praying for you. I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, with the pressure of being in a home church and, and, and my mother in town, I, I spent all night working on this sermon. And not that it was one that I wrote this week. When, when Pastor Bill called me on Wednesday, I, I had decided I've been praying, and, and it's, it's a sermon that I had written a few months ago and preached at a different church about how faith and action can change a nation. But I spent all night, I was probably up till one in the morning, and, and my, one of my biggest fears is coming up here and having nothing to say and being done in about five minutes and saying, you know, give thanks and all things give thanks and have a great day. And um, so I, I tend to try to put too much to fill time. And it reminded me of a story that I heard a preacher tell about this speaker. And uh, this speaker was set to speak for a half an hour. And uh, he's going and the half hour comes and goes. 45 minutes, this, this speaker's still going. Hour goes by, he's not even slowing down. He's just going and going and going and going. And an hour and a half later, I mean, he's just going. And finally, a, a man in the back row takes off his shoe and attempts to throw it at the speaker. Falls short and hits a lady sitting in the front row. And the uh, speaker is oblivious. He's still going. And the man is, runs up to, to console the lady and, and pick her up and says, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? And she looked at him and she says, no. I can still hear him. Hit me again. Well, we'll be looking at um, 2 Kings chapter 18. This is the main passage. But we'll be spending more time in 2 Chronicles 28, 29, and 30. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain that as we go. Uh, but so, so put a bookmark in, in 2 Kings 18, 1 through 8, verse 1 through 8. And then 2 Chronicles 28. And we'll be, we'll be, we'll be looking at, at, at faith in action. But I'd like to... Go ahead and open us in prayer, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Thank you for this group of believers who have come here in the beautiful rain that you have blessed us with, to assemble with each other as, as you command us to do, to stir up love and good works. And I just pray, Lord, that you would bless us with your presence, that you would, that you would open and penetrate our hearts and our minds with the truth of your word this morning as it relates to Hezekiah and how one man's faith into action changed a nation. Lord be with us. Stir our hearts this morning. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever heard the phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? Maybe you ever heard that phrase? Well, I was reading it, another pastor wrote this. His name is Chris Twightman, talking about that phrase. And he says, this adage 
is stating what is often an observable fact, that a child usually mirrors the qualities and traits of their parent. In some cases, though, traits are passed down genetically. For example, many of you know my daughter, youngest daughter, Annabelle. For better or for worse, she kind of looks like me. Um, I'll leave it at that. Physically, though, uh, you know, she may be an image of me. Uh, but this phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, isn't really speaking so much of biology, but about influence. And if we use the image of an apple dropping from a tree, we can imagine the apple is still going to be close to that tree. Uh, the apple is within reach of the tree. Uh, the apple is still under the tree's shadow. In other words, this saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, speaks more to the qualities and traits that children learn from their parents. As children observe, listen to, and mirror the speech of their parents, the people with whom they focus and spend most of their energy, children become like them in how they think, how they speak, and how they do life. Well, today, we're going to look at an apple that did fall far from the tree, Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a son of King Ahaz, whom the Bible says he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. Hezekiah was a bad king. And if you know this time of history, Israel is in two kingdoms, but there's, there's one bad king after the other. And Israel is, since the time of David and Solomon, for hundreds of years, they just are going into a moral and spiritual decline. One wicked king after the other. Uh, and Ahaz, and, and every now and then they had a good king that would, there would be a, a glimmer of hope and then they'd go back down. And King Ahaz is one of those uh, wicked kings. And uh, in, in 2 Chronicles 28.1, uh, actually in verses 2 through 4, it says, Ahaz walked in the ways of the other kings of Israel. He made metal images for the Baals. He made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt, burned his sons as an offering. I want you to think about that. He burned his own sons as an offering according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and under the hills and under every green tree. And they used to, the pagans used to worship under green trees because they thought that would bring you blessing. A green tree is healthy, and so this tree is going to bless us if we worship and do sacrifices near it. Skipping down to verse 19, it says, He encouraged moral decline and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. This is King Ahaz. This is the tree. Verse 22, 2 Chronicles 28, In the time of his distress, he became yet more faithless to the Lord. This same King Ahaz, for he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus that had defeated him and said, Because the gods of the king of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. See, Ahaz was so bad and Israel was in such moral decline that God raised up Syria to defeat them. King Ahaz, instead of recognizing oh, and humbling himself before God, he says, you know what, I'm going to go figure out who those gods of Damascus are. Because they must be powerful than the God of Israel. This, the passage is going to say, But they were a ruin of him and all Israel. And they has gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. And he shut up the doors of the house of the Lord and made himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem to these foreign and pagan gods. In every city of Judah, he made high places to make offerings to other gods, provoking to anger the Lord, the God of his fathers. That's King Ahaz. That's the tree. I'll go back to, to 2 Kings 18, 1 through 8. And here's Hezekiah, his son. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshiah, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah began to reign, takes over after his father dies. 
He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name is Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did, Zechariah, what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father, King David, had done centuries before. Now, let me pause right there. This got my attention. And I try to read through the Bible chronologically every year. And when you do that, you spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. As you get through it, it's wicked king, bad king, bad king, bad king, bad king. Then all of a sudden, he did what was right. And I stopped right there and I wrote a little note. Because I wanted to know, what did Hezekiah do right in this time of moral decline that God was pleased? I mean, have you ever heard people say, I'm just trying to do right the best I can to please God? Anybody ever heard that? Everybody said that I have. So what did Hezekiah, this apple, do differently? 2 Kings 18, I'll pick back up in verse 4. It says, He removed the high places, broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made hundreds of years before. For until those days the children of Israel were burning incense to it, and calling it Nehushtan. Think about that. This bronze serpent. If you know the story of the bronze serpent that Moses, when... The Israelites were in their journey, their, their, their disobedience walking in the wilderness. They were complaining and grumbling. And God sent serpents to bite them. And many of them were dying. And they cried out to God, please heal us. And so God told Moses to make a bronze serpent, put it on a, on, on a pole and hang it up on the, and put it up. And anyone who looks to that bronze serpent will be healed. Now that foreshadows the cross of Christ. Look to the cross, you'll be healed. Trust in that. Well, they had saved this. I mean, what a nice artifact to have. Through the centuries, they had saved this bronze serpent. But now the people were worshiping it. Now think about Hezekiah. He comes right in and he breaks this ancient artifact. Even at that time, it was an ancient artifact. Belonged, you know, Moses made this. Verse 5, he, Hezekiah, trusted in the Lord God of Israel. So that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. The same king of Assyria that his father had gone and brought their gods and mingled in with all of the temple worship. So how was Hezekiah able to undo all the wickedness that his father had instilled in the land? And in, and in doing so, please the Lord. And the Bible is calling him the best, basically the best king since David and Solomon. Now King David and his son Solomon, that was kind of the pinnacle of, of Israel. And it just kind of went downhill for centuries until they were, they were put into captivity. So how did he do this? He did it one by reformation and rededication, followed by a celebration, and then that led to a revitalization. And we're going to unpack that uh, right now. And I'll go back to Second Chronicles uh, chapter 29. Hezekiah institutes reformation. In verse 3, it says, In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Remember, his father had shut the doors of the house of God. Here he opens them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites. Now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth or the rubbish from this holy place. So this is the, his first month in office. Notice, he did not waste any time. The moment he had the authority to institute change. With no procrastination. No business meeting. No committees were formed. There was no, according to the CDC, we could reopen. <laughs> the CDC being an entity that had no authority to close anybody, but yet many of us did voluntarily. 
And that same CDC said the liquor stores and the abortion clinics should stay open because those are essential services. This is an essential service. Right here. That's another sermon for another day. I mean, it's easy to look back and criticize, and I may have done and acted in a similar fashion. But there were many pastors who stood firm on the authority of God. But what about you and me? Are our doors to the temple open? Have we closed the temple doors? And you might be thinking right now, well, you're not a very bright pastor. Our church is obviously open. I'm not talking physically. As we're, as we're standing here in this, in this beautiful building, I'm talking spiritually. Have we shut the doors to our hearts, to God? Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. See, in the, in the days of, of in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God dwelled in the temple, the physical temple. But now, in this church age, we are the temple. God's Spirit dwells within us. The moment we accept Christ as Savior, we are sealed with that guarantee. That's God's down payment. Say, I'm coming back for you. I bought you. I own you. And I'm coming back for you. And here's my spirit in you as a guarantee. First month, Hezekiah. The Reformations, he reopened the temple doors. Told them, the Levites, now consecrate yourself. See, the Levites needed to be holy themselves before they could undertake the task of making the temple holy. One commentator wrote this, McConville, he stated, it's one thing to be a priest or a Levite, but quite another to be fit at any given time to act as such. Hezekiah's charge to the priest was clear. You are not fit for service in your current state of impurity. Consecrate yourselves. Did you know that we as believers in Christ are priests as well? Peter writes this, 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. As a member of the royal priesthood of Christ, are you fit for service to the king? I ask you, I, I ask you these questions because these are the questions I ask myself when reading these passages. You know, where, where, where has God placed you? Not everyone is called to be into vocational ministry. God may have you right where you are in the workplace, in the marketplace, in your clubs to serve him. read the story of a lumberjack who was starting a new job. And his friend said, you don't want to go with that, that crew. Once they find out you're a Christian, they're just going to ridicule you, harass you, and make your life miserable. The man said, I'll be fine. Don't you worry about me. About a year later, he ran into him again. He says, hey, did you make it? How'd the job go? Did they, with you being a Christian and all, did you make it? He said, yeah, I'm doing fine. I never let them know as a Christian, so I'm fine. Where has God placed you for service? And do they know that you're a royal priest of Christ? Hezekiah charged these priests. He said, get rid of all the filth and, and the rubbish that has come into this temple. All defilement was to be removed from the sanctuary. Probably has to do with what, what his father, King Ahaz, brought from the other gods. All these artifacts and mingled it with the worship of the true living God. He said, get it out. It took them several weeks to clear the temple. Our 
Are there impurities in your life that King Jesus wants to rid you of? What cultural idols have you and me allowed into our inner sanctuary, our hearts? Like I said, it took them a few weeks to remove the filth from the temple, but we have the ability to be cleansed instantly. Instantly. Through the atoning blood of Jesus. 1 John 1.9 Because if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our, all our sins and to cleanse us from, excuse me, forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all Unrighteousness. This is talking to us as believers. It doesn't say some of our unrighteousness. All. If we just confess with a repentant heart. I mean, we're not immune as believers to collecting filth. Filth and rubbish comes into our life at different times. But Jesus made the sacrifice for us to be cleansed. We don't have to do what they did in Hezekiah. They cleansed the temple. They had to, to slaughter and kill animals and spill that blood. That was part of the purification process. We don't have to do that. The blood has already been spilt. God himself did the sacrifice. We don't have to sacrifice our own sons in the fire. God sacrificed his son on the cross. So that we could be healed and cleansed the moment we believe. And it's permanent. Now that filth and the rubbish, sometimes it comes in. And Jesus said, just confess. You're forgiven. What has replaced God in the mercy seat of our hearts? The Reformation, now Hezekiah, now leads a rededication to the, after the purification process. And there's a lot in these verses, so I encourage you to go back and read it. But there, there, there's a lot here. And we're in, in 2 Chronicles 29. And, and this rededication starts corporately. And they brought all the bulls and the rams. And I'm in verse 21, if you're following along. 2 Chronicles 29, 21. And they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom in the sanctuary, and for Judah. So that's a corporately cleansing and rededication of the temple. Then Hezekiah opens the altars for everyone individually. In verse 31, he says, Come near now to all those who are there. Bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings. And all who were of a willing heart... That's the key of a willing heart brought burnt offerings. It's one thing to, to corporately worship and praise as a church, and, and, and we do that. But the true repentance, it comes from a willing heart. Hezekiah can't do that for you. I can't do that. Pastor Bill, Pastor Zach can't do that for you. It's a willing heart. You have to come to God. You have to come to Jesus with a willing heart. a personal, personal decision. So in his first month, Hezekiah had reestablished proper temple worship, an accomplishment that brought great rejoicing. So now they move to a celebration. Chapter 30, 2 Chronicles chapter 30. So the king now wanted to resolve and reinstitute uh, the Passover. They had stopped even celebrating the Passover. So Hezekiah, in, in, in chapter 30 there, verse 1, he says, He sent to all Israel and Judah, wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh across the way, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. So he's inviting now the northern kingdom and saying, Hey, come. We're just going to celebrate. And let's return to the Lord. So couriers went from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as the building but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. I mean, some came, but they were laughed and ridiculed. 
See, Hezekiah's zeal embraces all of Israel, even though they were in two kingdoms at the time. But he sends letters which, although the greater part laughed them to scorn, brought up many serious souls to worship the God of Israel in Jerusalem. Many did come. See, if everything is not reestablished as a whole, yet wherever faith is in action and a sincere heart seeks to glorify God, there is always cause for the faithful to rejoice in the dealings of God. Always. And now that the faithful have had reformation, rededication, and now celebration, what happens next is hearts on fire. A revitalization by the people. I read this story about a Lutheran bishop visiting a parish church in California and finding a stirring red and orange banner on the wall. Come Holy Spirit, hallelujah, it declared. And words printed under a picture of a, of a, uh, of a fire burning. This bishop was also interested in the sign directly underneath the banner, which said, fire extinguisher. So much for that parish's commitment to spiritual renewal. See, lip service, what does God think about lip service? It's faith in action. Yes, we confess Jesus with our mouth and believe in our heart that He has saved us, but then our faith in action 2 Chronicles 31.1 Now when all this was finished, all the rededication, all the, the killing of the bulls, and all the people with their willing hearts bringing their burnt offerings, when all this, and those that didn't mock and ridicule came and worshipped, when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke in pieces the pillars, cut down the Asherim, and broke down the high places and the altars throughout all Judah, and Benjamin, and in Ephraim, and in Manasseh, until they had destroyed them all. Then all the people of Israel returned to their cities, every man to his possession. Faith in action. The people went out and tore down the high places that King Ahaz they were. Faith in action. James writes this, chapter 2, 17 and 18. Faith by itself does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. The faith by all was present and very much alive. Think about that revival. Hearts on fire. They went out on their own, energized and renewed by God, and rid of everything that God hated out of the cities and from those that mocked and ridiculed them as well. This faith in action, it starts from the inside. It starts with us. The whole movement back to God here in, in Hezekiah's day, this was a one-man movement. It was Hezekiah's doing. No, no priest is named as prominent in it. No prophet is named so I, as I was studying, and I was like, what was prompting the king? What could have been prompting the king? I mean, it's obvious that Hezekiah is not an apple from Ahaz's tree. That's very, very clear. But it does mention one other person in the description of Hezekiah. In 2 Kings 18, 1 and 2, it says, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to raise. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. Now, I didn't just add this here because my mother is here. I wrote this months ago. So, there's also another tree that likely influenced Hezekiah, God the Father. See, Hezekiah seemed to know what pleased God, unlike his father Ahaz. And maybe his mother brought him up and influenced him on the scriptures in those days. 
We don't really know. But the word of God speaks very clearly. Joshua 1.8. God gave Joshua some instructions. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Psalmist wrote this, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. To meditate it means more than just reading a chapter a day it keeps the devil away. It means to internalize his word. Read it. Chew on it. Internalize it. What does God's word say? I'll go back to Deuteronomy. You don't have to turn there, but Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 4. Moses giving instructions to the Israelites hundreds of years before this Hezekiah story. Moses says this, These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess. Remember, they're, they're getting close to entering the promised land. And God's giving them instructions. God's giving you this land, he's telling them, but you better be careful to do all that he commands you. Deuteronomy 12, 2. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods. On the high mountains, on the hills, and under every green tree. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. Which is exactly what King Ahaz did. So, what did Hezekiah do? Go, if you're still in 2 Kings 18, verses 3 and 4, it says, He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. It's not unreasonable that he may have meditated on those scriptures from Deuteronomy. But he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Hezekiah, he removed the high places, broke the sacred pillars, Cut down the wooden image. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel. So that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah. Nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. And he did not depart from following him. But kept his commandments. Which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him, Hezekiah. And he prospered wherever he went. Now, prosperity is not material wealth. I'm talking about prosper and good success and living in an abundant life that God will give you. It starts with meditating on His Word. I don't preach a health and wealth gospel and I don't believe in a health and wealth gospel. But God will give you success according to what He deems is success. So here's the question. What tree are you an apple from? Let's take a minute. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and just think. What tree are you an apple from? What high places, sacred pillars, Wooden images do you need to clean out of your temple and mine? 
our hearts. What is God speaking to you right now? What, what reforms may he be telling you to make in your own life? What idols and rubbish or filth, as the Bible calls it, needs to be carried out of our hearts? Maybe like the people in, in Hezekiah's day, after they made these reforms, and maybe you've already made these reforms, and you're in a, in a place of rededicating your life, do you need to make that decision today? You know what? I've let some, some rubbish in. I've let some filth creep in that shouldn't be here. I know it doesn't please the Lord. And I want to rededicate my life. And I want to, and I want to, I want to tell somebody about it. Because even as believers, the filth and the rubbish creeps in their life. Does, does it mean we lose our salvation? No. But we can lose our fellowship with God. And we can, we can struggle through life. I heard the story of a lady who asked the evangelist Billy Sunday. She said to him, why do you keep having revivals when it doesn't last? He asked her, why do you keep taking baths? What steps do you need to take to put your faith in action today? Make that commitment to God in your heart. And in a minute, you're, you're more than welcome to come down and, and speak to us. Speak to myself. Pastor Zach. I'd like to ask Pastor Zach to go to the, to the library room. And if you want to go back and if you just want prayer, you want to tell him some good news, you want to celebrate something, you want to rededicate, Pastor Zach is in, is in the back room here. The altar will also be open if you want to come and stand publicly. What steps do you need to take? Make that commitment to God. Maybe you're here today and God is speaking to your heart, but you don't know what's going on. There's something stirring in my heart. I, I, I don't know. I mean, this happened to a religious man in Jesus' day named Nicodemus. He was curious about Jesus. He had questions. He was a very religious man. A good man, but didn't know Jesus. Had all the knowledge in his head of the scriptures. He came to see Jesus one night when Jesus told him, You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And that didn't make sense to Nicodemus. How can you be born again? Jesus said you must be born of, of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Or my question is, are you born again? See, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God made a way through Jesus that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone there's not just a special selected group. It's God's desire that all people be saved. That's God's heart. He wants everyone to come to saving grace. He didn't just choose a few. It's available to everyone. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. And Jesus will carry out all the filth that is in us. And wash us white as snow, no matter what you have done. And you could say, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't. God does, and he wants to forgive you. He wants to forgive you. There's nothing that you can do that will disqualify you from receiving God's grace except disbelief. That's it. Dying in your sins. But like they did in Hezekiah's day, Hezekiah opened up the altar for all those who had a willing heart. So if you have a willing heart, please come. It's a choice. I'll be down. I know we're going to have a song. And we'll sing. And if you're physically able to, 
Would you stand? I'll be down here if you want to pray with me, if you want to receive Christ. Maybe you want to join the church. Maybe you've been dating this church for a while. You say, you know, I want to make this my church home. These are some good people. Well, we are, we are good people only because God gives us His goodness. As Pastor Bill always says, there's two people. There's lost sinners and there's saved sinners. Where are you? We're a, we're a hospital for the sin and the sick. So if you're a lost sinner, or maybe you're a saved sinner, you want to you celebrate that, you know what? I'm giving my life back to Jesus again. Come. Pastor Zach is in the back if you want, to, want a little bit more privacy. Pastor Bill is here. I'll be down here. Whatever decision God is laying on your heart, please come. Amen. Thank you, brother. In the back. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I want to introduce to you a good old friend of mine, John, who just... It's you. <laughs> My friend, John Bedell, we've known each other for a long time, and uh, he's decided to make this his church home. Amen. He wants to be a member here. John and I go back a long way, over 20 years, and uh, both of us have different stories and different similarities in how we are both different people than when we first met 20 plus years ago. Amen. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> but God has washed us white as snow, and, 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 and praise the Lord. So would you, before you dismiss, and, and I know that the turkey's cooking, but come say, welcome John home, and he's going to transfer his letter and We'll get that all taken care of. We'll get it done first class mail. Transfer that letter. So, so thank you. Um, I'll bless the food for today. I also want to say one other thing. You know, when I was here and, and Pastor allowed me to, to stand in the pulpit back in April, I talked about my most recent trip to Kenya and kind of gave you a 10-year synopsis of our mission work in Kenya. And many of you after that approached myself and Melissa said, when you go again, we want to go. We want to be a part of that, what God is doing. Well, we're going again, and this is your call. We're, we're planning to go again in March. So if you want to go with us, or you want, just want to know for more information, come see me, uh, Melissa, um, today, or, or message us, and we'll get you some information. But we're, we're going to plan to go in during the, during the spring break week of next March, um, going, going back to Kenya again. So... Um, Pastor, do you have any announcements? One announcement yep. before you pray. Mm -hmm. uh, we need some help getting these boxes over to Chiefland on Monday. So I need someone that either has a big Suburban or a truck or two to help us get these 300 boxes to Chiefland. And uh, so Carol just texted me and said, remind me to do that. So uh, sign up during lunch or right after the church service. Let us know if you can do that for us. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I guess we'll pray and we'll eat. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for, for dwelling with us, Lord. Not just in our hearts, but your presence is known in this building. Thank you for blessing us with your presence, Lord. And we, your word says to give thanks always, no matter what. And I know there's those here who are going through different situations some health, some financial, some unspoken, that we don't even know what's going on. God does. His word says, give thanks. No, he, he has everything under control. And we thank you, Lord. You are sovereign. And we just ask for your, we give thanks for the abundance of food that we're about to eat, Lord. Give thanks for the fellowship that we have here for this, this church and blessing us with your presence, Lord. Uh, be with us as we leave. And Lord, just work in our hearts to make any reforms, rededications, changes that you have laid on us this morning, Lord. Help us to put that faith in action. Because with one man's faith, it changed a nation. And we, Lord knows, you know, Lord, that our nation needs changing. Our nation is in trouble. But through your mercy, you, have, you are still sparing us and protecting us and blessing us, Lord. We don't deserve it as a nation. Lord, forgive us, our nation, of our national sins. And Lord, stir in your people's hearts to pray. 
that you would heal our land and bring us back to you what our forefathers, a nation founded and dedicated to you, the true God, the God of the Bible. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.